Thank you, Barrett. Thank you. Well, here we go again. Is everybody having a good time? Isn't this great to come together for a conference like this and just give yourself permission to open up your heart and go into an experience and feel the relaxation of that, how natural it feels. We've got balloons blowing, <laughs> blowing through the auditorium here, flying through the air. It's got a celebration feel. And I think that kind of as we watch these retreats and, and conferences and gatherings evolve as we go along, um, as you keep practicing the principles, as you keep trusting and you keep relaxing and opening up, it will take more and more of a, of a celebratory tone. It will come more into celebrations. And um, I mentioned a couple early Course in Miracles teachers who were Bill Thetford's teachers, the Lucketts, Jack and Eulalia Luckett. And they traveled all over the world sharing the Course. They would go to continents and, and share the Course on different continents. Uh, and their form of sharing was, they called it garden parties. So you know that when the originators kind of went out and, and they used the word party, uh, that was good. Because they were sharing not only their teachings of the Course, uh, and they were very devoted teachers, but uh, they were also very much into the experience of joy. And that's why Bill Thetford really left Northern California to go live with the Lucketts during the last years of his life, because of the joy. He was actually attracted to the joy. Uh, he had gone through the, the study phase, he'd gone through the workbook, he'd gone through course groups, he'd gone through going different places. He was actually kind of quiet. He didn't share a lot, as I, I said. But he came to these garden parties and he also basically moved in with the Lucketts. Uh, and when he passed away, he, he had his stuff there. Uh, with the Lucketts, because um, he was living with them. And that's one of the things I'd like to talk about today, because, um, you know, we've had a lot of professional conferences with speakers and so on and so forth, and we still have speakers at this one. Actually, next summer, um, we're planning a, uh, it's going to be called Celebration of Inner Peace, but actually, um, I mentioned at the conference down in Las Vegas, uh, at the presenters meeting at the end, that uh, at the Foundation for Inner Peace basically was the original copyright holder. They hold the copyright right now and basically they're the ones in charge of translating the course into all of these different languages. I think we're up to around 20, 20 some, 22 or 25 maybe. and. Um, that's been a great effort. Every time I've talked to Judy, you know, she was very aware of her function as publishing and distribution dissemination. Helen was very aware that she was the scribe. Um, Bill was like the, he was like the comforter for Helen because she was very nervous and anxious and had a lot of resistance. And uh, uh, Judy told me that they actually went to a psychic reading, uh, all four of them, and um, uh, the reader basically said that uh, that in many previous lifetimes, Bill, Sh Bill Thetford had been Helen Shuckman's teacher, and that he didn't even mention him by name. He just he pointed to him with his eyes closed when he was doing the reading. Judy said and just said, um, "This one has been uh, a teacher of that one for many lifetimes, and he feels." like he's just a, a fourth wheel, that he's not really, that Helen's the big show, and he's just there to assist, and he doesn't have much in terms of contribution. But the whole reading was basically how Bill was, had a tremendous influence. Actually, the reading said that uh, Bill basically had, had really helped prepare Helen to be able to use her gift, his scribal gift, in this lifetime through all those so it just gave a much broader thing that nothing is as it seems on the surface. And they, Judy said, when the reader said this, you know, his eyes closed, Bill just burst into tears. Because he, it was his own unworthiness being healed. It was another reflection 
that we have no idea about this larger plan that's way beyond what meets the eye in this world. And if we even had a faintest glimmering of it, we would weep. We would be crying so hard. We would have uncontrollable tears of love if we had a faintest glimmering of the bigger picture. Gary mentioned last night too that, that uh, Jesus really wasn't a leader. He was a follower of the Holy Spirit. He was a devout follower and that's what allowed him to accept the atonement for himself because he was such a devout follower. And then when he accepted the atonement, we, do, we are told that now Jesus is the, the leader of the plan of atonement. He's the first one to accept his part perfectly and therefore he's in charge of it. That's the words, in charge of. And so anybody who's got any kind of embarrassment or a little resistance to Jesus, which is pretty common, uh, Jerry and I were talking about that, how common that could be to have a resistance to Jesus. But actually, he's the one in charge. He's the one, you might say, that's orchestrating time and, and space. He says, I will go before you. If you'll be a miracle worker for me, I will arrange time and space for you. That's quite amazing. That means that you don't have to hold on to these personal ideas of, I have to do this, this, this first. Basically, if you're willing and ready, uh, you are being called. You have, as uh, Dove said the other day, you've already given your consent, as he mentioned in the lesson. So if you've already given your consent, and Jesus is saying, you are ready now, uh, and he's the one in charge, you can't be projecting your unworthiness and, oh, not why me, and why'd you choose me, and maybe you meant that one over there, or that one there. <laughs> They're good. We were all talking... I was talking about how shy I was, and Gary, and then Cindy mentioned how shy she was. What, what is this? The, we're the brigade of the shy, shy people now <laughs> are coming on. And the first brigade, Jesus was in charge of the plan, and, and you never notice with Ken and Judy, you go down the line, he picked all these Jews. There were all these Jews all the way around. You know, he got his home team, you know. Uh, he's coming in here. Catholics? No. Buddhists? No. They're all Jews, if you really sit back and you look at it, you know. So, and now he's taken the shy brigade, you know, to, to spread the word all over the world, you know. It's like, hey, he is in charge here, and we don't have a clue, <laughs> actually. From within the dream, you don't really have a clue how big it is and how marvelous it is. So, you know, to me, I felt like my relationship with Jesus always came first. And then people have said, you know, a lot of times in Eastern traditions, like with Yogananda and Ramana Maharshi, there's all these, there's gurus, there's lineages. You know, you have a lineage of a guru who teaches you, and sometimes they show up in your dreams, and it's very psychic, and it's been a way. Uh, people have asked me over and over, David, who, who was your teacher? Uh, Sam just asked me that recently, a couple, two, three days ago. Who's your teacher? Who was your teacher? And I said, Jesus. I didn't even hesitate. Uh, Jesus' voice came to me and was, it wasn't like an audible voice, but like with Helen, it was a stream of thoughts. And it seemed to be like around the late 1980s when I tuned into that stream and I thought, well, here we go. Life is going to be fun now because of following that teaching, following that instruction. Uh, Dove mentioned too his, his, his big learning curve and how when Regina came in, in 2005 she had a real two year, you weren't here Regina, but he's telling about your two year little learning curve, parabola, you know, where you just jumped right in and got in touch with your internal teacher and then NTI and it's like away we go. Dove was like, well, you know, I just hung in there with it for 27 years. <laughs> it took her two, took me 27. But if we tune into Christ, if we tune into the Holy Spirit, if we turn into Jesus, we basically are going to be giving our instructions because that's really how it works. You know, we've heard about that, about the Holy Spirit. He will go before you, making straight your path and leaving in your way no obstacles to trip on and no, nothing to bar your way. It's just going to be a clear pathway if you are willing to tune in and listen. And it was beautiful that Dove mentioned that we're just, just about getting in touch with your internal teacher. It's not how long you study the Course, 
It doesn't have anything to do with time or actually study, but it actually is all designed to put you in touch with your internal teacher. And then once that happens, once that link is made, then your way is set. Now, what does that mean, your way is set? It means that the Spirit will go before you and it will give you everything that you're to say and to do, every person you're to meet, every place you're to move. I remember years ago, Regina talking about, oh, I'm supposed to move to Colorado, and here we all are, gathered in Colorado. You know, we, she came out, we came out. We, we follow. The plan is very specific, very specific. So you're given what you're to do. You don't have to like analytically figure it out. You don't have to weigh the pros and cons. You don't have to say, try to f figure out your future. You actually just have to stay tuned in moment by moment and let the plan be given to you. And that's, that actually runs against all of our conditioning, doesn't it? I mean, we've all been raised to learn and weigh the opportunities, weigh the options, and and really come up with a plan for the future, a two-year plan, a five-year plan, a ten-year plan. That really is out the window. If any of you have ever read, you know, Lesson 135, basically in there we're told, a healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan. And it also goes on to say, if there are plans, you will be told of one who knows, from one who knows. That's obviously Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So, I like that word, relieved. Relieved of the belief that you must plan. Wow, that sounds very relaxing. <laughs> that sounds like that's worthy of our, our effort and attention to come to that. There's even a part in that lesson, you know, where he just gives some conditions, like Dove was talking about, conditions for peace. And basically, the conditions come in there basically saying, you really have to be clueless. You, clueless. you can't even know the problem that the plan was made to solve. Wow, I can't even know the problem that the plan was made to solve. Because why? Because the Holy Spirit is here to overlook the problem entirely. We're to come into a state of mind, that's what the plan of salvation is, where we're so in divine innocence, we're so in divine connection, divine love, that we cease to see a problem. If the Holy Spirit looks and in everything and everyone sees himself, then that must mean love. That must mean everything and everyone is to be perceived in forgiveness, and then ultimately experienced as just our self, just one self as the Christ. An idea in the mind of God. So, this is very different from problem-solving approaches in the world, where we're kind of asked to define the problem. You know, that's one of the keys in science, you know, find out what the problem is. In business, find out what your problem is, so you can go and go for the solution. But with A Course in Miracles, he's saying, no, if you're going to go for the atonement, that solution, which is our one sole responsibility, then you're going to have to be quite clueless about the world. If you still want to bring past learning, it's going to block your acceptance of the atonement. It's kind of like accepting the atonement an opening to move in that direction would, would kind of like be asking a mammal to breathe liquid oxygen. You know, mammals, they're really good with air. <laughs> and it's actually possible for mammals to breathe liquid oxygen. If you pump pink liquid oxygen in a mammal, they can actually breathe that oxygen, but it's very difficult. It's very new and they will fight and kick when that liquid goes in. If you put liquid in a mammal's lungs, they're going to fight and kick. That's kind of what Jesus is doing with us, with <laughs> the Spirit. <laughs> Humans are used to breathing air, and he's sending in the liquid of the Holy Spirit. And we're <laughs> I gotta survive. I got a mortgage to pay. I got children. I'm not you can't be calling me now. Call me in 10 years. Come on, please. 
You know, there's a lot of fighting and kicking and screaming. I'm shy. I'm shy. You've got the wrong one. Over there. <laughs> Your only function is let the voice for God speak through you. I'm shy. You've got the wrong one. Over there. We're going to have to have a shy convention. Shy Course in Miracles speakers, you know. That's what we do anyway when we get together. We go, oh, isn't that that's amazing how that happened, you know. So, anyway, I, I know Jesus is in charge, so a lot of the stuff that I've done, I mean, I put lots of stuff on the web and teach a lot of things t for free, you know, because basically when you go through the text of the Course, early on, basically, you got the three lessons of the Holy Spirit, to have, give, all to all. Wow, is that like breathing uh, liquid? Uh, that's going to throw a wrench in your economic financial beliefs, you know, economic survival. She works hard for the money. Oh man, you've got, you've got to undo a lot. That's perhaps the hardest one, and that's only the first of the three lessons, to have, give all to all. You know, we sometimes see it in children, you know, where the children are going and you give them candy and they, they give it away. They're just, you ever see little children sometimes, they're so giving, they're not concerned at all about things. They're just like, oh, what an example. To have, give all to all. And this has been something that's been really important to me because I remember Jesus taught, freely you have received, now freely give. And that means you have to really unlearn a lot of reciprocity, scarcity, lack. If you believe in any of those, uh, you're not going to be into freely I have received, freely I shall give. There's going to be a part against you in your mind is going, be careful. Don't be too giving. You're going to pay for this. You're going to be really sorry for being so free with your giving. But Jesus was never sorry. He, he gave, and he does tell us later on, I don't know if you remember the ten characteristics of a teacher of God in the Manual for Teachers, but I think it's number seven, generosity. He says that really true giving is the exact opposite of what giving is in this world. Exact opposite. That's pretty radical for him to say exact opposite. Because I think most of us, when we think of generosity, a lot of us can think of like philanthropists who give a lot of money. The Carnegies, the Ted Turners, you know, we have, there's a lot of people that are really, they seem to have a lot of wealth, accumulated wealth, and they give it away. And Jesus says, true generosity is the exact opposite of that, of what generosity seems to be in the world. So what he's telling us to, he's saying, listen, ideas are strengthened as they're given away. They give more to the giver and to the receiver. There's no loss involved in sharing true ideas. And that's why everyone's given a teaching function, to share true ideas. And really, it's not you who do it. So it's not, you don't have to be concerned and say, well, I'm not a very good speaker, and I'm, I'm not going to, I don't know if I'll say the right words. And, you know, you could see in these beautiful roundtables, you could speak from your heart. That's the very beginning stages of learning to, to clear away the darkness and let those true ideas pour through you and let them be strengthened in your awareness. Now, that's generosity. If Jesus tells me that the only function the body has is to let the voice for God speak through it, I'm going to take that very, very sincerely. In fact, if you look at the parable of David, I was into, I was into Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, I camped out in places like this, I, I skied, I played tennis, basketball, baseball, I did all kinds of things with this body, and then in my late 20s when I I gave myself over to Jesus in the Course in a very, you might say, uncompromising, radical way. He said, listen, I want to let my voice speak through it. And that's just a, a metaphor for your purification of your consciousness. Don't think that there's anything special about being a voice piece for the Holy Spirit. It's just, this is how the backdrop will look for your transformation of consciousness, and it'll look different for other people. Some will sing through the body, some will laugh through the body, some will hug through the body. I like all of those, <laughs> all of the above. It gives you an opportunity to just let the love flow through you in an involuntary way, where you're not 
still trying to consciously decide where the miracles should be bestowed. Jesus says, I'll go before you and I'll tell you which miracles to perform. He had a lot of teachings. Uh, he talked about Edgar Casey, he called him Casey, but he said Casey had a, a great contribution to the plan of awakening. He said it could have been even more productive, more helpful if he had asked me which miracles to perform. Isn't that something? Everyone knows Edgar. What was a tremendous contribution. And it would have been more helpful if he had asked me. Now just from what I've said right there, it should tell you how important it is to get in touch with your internal teacher. Because if you want to be most helpful in the plan, you have to be in touch with the internal teacher. As Dove was sharing, you know, Dove studied the course for, worked with the course for 27 years just to come to that point of realizing that, oh my gosh, it's just being in touch with the internal teacher. And the quicker you can come to that, the more you're just available and helpful in the plan. You don't, if you're in touch with your internal teacher, you don't have to be comparing yourself. Oh, I wish I could sing like this one. I wish I could speak like this one. I wish I had the memory and the recall of this one. You don't have to get into all this comparison. You know, your way could be one of, of deep stillness. Uh, there's a part in The Course in Miracles where it says, a teacher of God could heal the world without a sound. Without a sound. Wow, that would be an interesting pathway. <laughs> Sounds like Gary's joke last night about <laughs> hungry, cold, <laughs> bed, hard, <laughs> you know. All you do is complain <laughs> after 30 years. You know, we, we could get called into the silence and that very well could be our contribution in the plan of atonement. I know Regina's been being called into the silence more and more. She mentioned that and Tony mentioned it to me again when I talked to him in California. You know, we have to start to re realize that the mechanism of miracles, the mechanism that we really wake up to the atonement is really prayer. It's the prayer of the heart is what activates us to accept the atonement. And words are but symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. So the ego made the symbols and basically with the Course, Jesus is saying, we want to use those symbols in a helpful way. And the body is part of that as well. I, I know that powerful healing session that took place here, we were talking about yesterday, it happened yesterday, and then the discussions came in about the body. I would basically say that, yeah, the body is just a symbol that the Holy Spirit can use, Jesus can use, that will strengthen your determination, strengthen your inspiration, deepen your prayer, and to go for the ultimate healing, and truly the only healing, which is atonement. I know for a lot of people in Christian Science, Course in Miracles, you know, healing is a big topic. And I was speaking in Michigan many years ago, and a woman came to me after the talk and said, can we take a walk together uh, later in the week? And I said, yes. And when I met with her, um, she said that she was a 100% healer. 100% healer is basically anyone who ever came to her, their symptoms left. Not only physically, but psychologically. And her healing modality was tuning in to her guide, her internal teacher. She would join with the internal teacher, and she would listen and follow to the internal teacher. And whoever she met with, whether they were there in person or remotely, their symptoms would disappear. And so we were walking, I said, that's wonderful, what a great use of your life <laughs> to be used in that way. And she said, I've got questions. I said, okay. So we took a walk, and, and the first question was, she said, there was a man that contacted me from Oklahoma, she was living in Michigan, and the man, was, I think was diagnosed with cancer, terminal illness, and he said, I've heard about you, and I want to join with you in prayer because I really want to be healed, and, um, and then she was internally told, tell him to come to Michigan. I said, okay, so what's the question? And she said, well, why did the Holy Spirit ask him to come to Michigan 
if remote healings are possible, why come all the way across the country? I said, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. You just told me that you're a 100% healer and everything you do is based on listening and following. Why now are you questioning the Holy Spirit about one of his instructions? And she's like, oh, oh, yeah, I see that. That's not really a question, is it? I said, no, that's not. And she said, that's right, that's not even a question. That's not my real question anyway. I've got, I've got a real, <laughs> I've got a real question. I said, okay, so continue on the walk. She said, well, people call me, they write to me, they come to me, and I pray, and their symptoms disappear. I said, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's how it works. Uh, and she said, and it happens over and over and over. This, sometimes it's the same people, they come with different symptoms. They just come, I go through the same thing, they have different symptoms, the symptoms disappear, they keep coming, they keep coming, they keep coming. And so she looked me right in the eye and she said, David, what is healing? Now you see, you have to understand the context of how profound this is for someone going through that experience to raise the question, what is healing? And what we did was, I brought my Course in Miracles book along, we popped up in the book, in the workbook lesson, and you know what the workbook lesson was? You probably can guess it, some of you. Only salvation can be said to cure. Only salvation. Healing is not removal of symptoms. That's window dressing. As Cindy was sharing last night, when you pray for healing, the symptoms may stay, they may disappear, but you are not to be invested in the outcome and appearances. What's the first lesson of the workbook? Nothing I see means anything. So let's run that through this whole idea about symptoms and appearances. Let's run that through lesson number one, the first lesson of the Course. Healing and atonement are not separate. Healing and atonement are identical. Symptom removal is looking to effects. And what does it tell us in The Course in Miracles? The Holy Spirit looks not to effects, it says. And if you want to accept the atonement and remember yourself as God created you, you have to look to the Holy Spirit and not to effects. Now last night, Gary and Cindy were bringing up the idea, Cindy mentioned this, I, I am the cause of the world. And Gary mentioned, I, the world is not done to me, the world is done by me. But, but ultimately, even the world is done by me, is just basically saying the ego projected the world. When we identify with the ego, with our powerful mind, that's how the projection seems to occur. When you try to get rid of this fearful, guilty feeling by projecting out a world and blaming the world. Oh, the world did it to me. I'm a victim of my, the time I was born, my culture, my society, my parents, my siblings, you know, my teachers, my doctors, my nurses. That's all just a projection of the ego. So even when we say the world was done by me, we're just we're just acknowledging that, that that's what miscreation is. That's not, there's no truth in that. If God didn't create the world, believe me, the world can't be done by Christ. The world is done by taking a powerful mind and giving it over to a crazy, tiny, mad idea, belief. And that's where the distortion occurs. That's where it's, it's a misidentification of forgetting your Christ self falling asleep and identifying with the ego. I was just talking with a, with a woman who's uh, part of Sounds True, because Sounds True is, is really big right here in Colorado, so Adyashanti and 
Eckert, a lot of, a lot of amazing, beautiful teachers uh, use sounds true. And we were having a good discussion, and having a tea at a tea house, and she was saying, I think the biggest problem is when I start to think that I'm responsible for my state of mind, is then I start to think, oh, and I'm also responsible for this mess. And I feel bad. And she said, most people who get into metaphysics and spirituality, they get to a certain point where they start to feel bad about whatever, wars, cancer, arguments in families. I'm doing this to myself. The secret of salvation is but this, you are doing this to yourself. He's talking about the dynamic of it's just your mind and your thoughts. And as long as you're identified with those judgments and attack thoughts, you seem to be doing it to yourself. That's not God's will. As Maria said, God's will is for joy. God's will is for happiness. You know, you've got to live your happy. But you aren't going to live your happy if you stay identified with attack thoughts and with judgments. Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount, judge not. So, when she was talking to me, she said, how do you address that, David? How does the Course in Miracles address this responsibility question? And I said, well, the most important line for me in the Course was Jesus telling me you are not responsible for the error. You are responsible for accepting the correction for the error. Wow. There's some true responsibility. That'll take you back to divine innocence. So all this shadow work that we're talking about, all this raising the darkness to the light, all this bringing illusions to the truth, is only for one point where you can align with your internal teacher and accept your divine nature. Hop off the wheel of processing. Hop off the wheel of the steps of forgiveness and go for atonement which literally lifts you and carries you with the Holy Spirit and Jesus' help into a place of perfect innocence where you can honestly feel in your heart, I have never done anything wrong ever or right. <laughs> Isn't that nice, that last part? You've never done anything wrong or right because you're not the doer. The doer is a body. We've just been convinced that behaviors are who we are. It's not the truth. Before Abraham was, I am. Before Jesus and the Apostles, I am. Before history was, I am. Yeah, try that one on. For yourself, take it in. Before history was, I am. That's why there's two parts in the Course where Jesus says, forgive me your illusions. What do you think he's talking about? Except forgive history. Forgive the man. Forgive the behaviors. Forgive everything. Forgive the crucifixion. Forgive the re seeming resurrection, rolling away the stone. Forgive all the images. Have no graven images before the Lord thy God. Wow, we're starting to really get a sense of what that means. Hold no graven images. Hold no appearances before the Lord thy God. Now, as Gary and, and Cindy were saying, you're still going to be guided to do things in this world. That's just the gentle way of waking up, of following your internal teacher. I don't think there's a more gentle way that there could be than to listen and follow your internal teacher. That's why the whole course is just aimed at that. Dove quoted from Lesson 189, forget this world, forget this course, and come with holy empty hands unto your God. It's really aiming us to follow our internal teacher. Now people have seen me traveling to these 40-some countries and sharing all the things that I've done over these last 20, 25 years of travel and 30 years with the Course, but there's some beautiful ones that came, um, that just kind of dropped into my lap. One time I was down in Argentina and I would go out into the rural areas and they couldn't afford the Course down there. These were like a lot of them women with children and they loved the course but they couldn't afford to buy the book. They would have Xerox copies of one chapter and all these women would huddle around at one of the women's house, they invite me to come there and they would pass around a, a, a Xerox copy of one of the chapters in Espanol, you know, in Cursa de Milagros. And they would, they would read it like they did gold in their hands. 
And if they couldn't get another copy, they'd do the same chapter over and over and over because they couldn't afford to buy the book. So Jesus was talking to me, and, and after this, uh, two or three trips down to Argentina, he said, you know, these people are ready for my course, but they can't afford to buy the book because the book's being printed up in the United States. And by the time it gets shipped down to Buenos Aires, there's all these fees, and then to get it out into the rural areas, Argentina's a big country, that one woman actually honestly said, with tears in her eyes, she said, it took me a half month's salary to buy Un Curso de Milagros. Think of that. Saving up a half month's salary to buy the book. And so, Jesus was speaking to me when I came back. I had all these signs and symbols around me uh, about the the things that the Bible went through in Europe and it was coming in very strong you've got to get the Course in Miracles in Spanish in an affordable way to the people of South America and so I went down to Bogota and I could feel it swirling right after that in my heart really strong Jesus was like here we go you know what Jesus says in the Course is it cannot be difficult to do the, cre the task that Christ appointed you to do for it is he who does it he was almost like, watch me. <laughs> watch me get this into the hands of the people in South America. You watch me. I go to a meeting, I meet this guy, Alberto, and uh, I walk up to him and I said, I think we've got something to do with getting A Course in Miracles down here in South America in an in a affordable way. Because Jesus is on my heart very strong and he's moving very swiftly here. And he says, great. I'll, it's almost like Helen and Bill, you know, Bill giving his speech, you know, to Helen, there must be a better way, and thinking Helen would laugh at him. And she went, you're exactly right, Bill, and I'll help you. Alberto, he looked at me and he said, Alberto Mendoza, he said, you're exactly right, and I'll help you. In, it took us about a couple years to get the plates from the Foundation for Inner Peace <laughs> shipped down to a factory in Colombia, rural Colombia, and we had it printed on Bible paper and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands were printed and they were shipped and disseminated all over South America. I even went down to the factory itself where the books were printed and then we hopped on a plane and I, and I took a whole box of them over to uh, a Medellin, and when I got there, there was a whole Course in Miracles Center in Medellin, and they saw this big box that it took three of us to bring it in, and they ripped it open, and it took them 30 seconds to take out all the books. They were so thirsty for Incurso de Milagros down there. And so, nowadays, can you tell me which book has have been printed and sold the most, the English version or the Spanish version? What do you think? Spanish. Spanish. <laughs> Overtook the English. Jesus is in charge of this plan. He will put that book where he wants it. Everybody was so concerned about the copyright of A Course in Miracles and how it could be stolen and leaked and all these different things could happen and I've heard all these different things about it everything. Hey listen, this is Jesus' plan. And I remind you about the lesson in a workbook of A Course in Miracles. My self is ruler of the universe. My capital self is ruler of the universe. Christ is the ruler of the universe. If any of you think the ego is ruling this universe, you better think again. Because JC Central, man, they handle everything. <laughs> you don't miss a thing. I do. You see every move I make. You, uh, Jesus is in charge. He's not only following like, where, like Gary said, oh boy is he in charge. He's really in charge of time and space. And he can handle anything in your life. The power of prayer from, from cancer, financial issues, whatever, if you link in with that internal teacher, you've got a good link and your problems don't have a chance against the power and the glory of God coming through Jesus Christ. So that was one little example 
of how I just linked in and Jesus has his way with everything. In fact, you know, people talk about the copyright controversy with the course and all the, everything went through and da 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 da. I was talking to Judy, I had lunch with her and she actually had a reading done where this was before there was any copyright controversy, but she was getting up in years and she basically had this reading done and the reading told her, you have one more forgiveness lesson in this lifetime. And it involves a copyright. She knew it before it happened. She, we talked about how that happened. We went into fine details. The script is written, as we talked about last night. The script is written. Everything is, is part of a prearranged plan. And we are simply mentally reviewing what has already gone by. We, don't, we can't understand anything from the linear perspective. Next time you're tempted to take a side, to take a position, to have a favorite or, or push something away, think again, that's not the plan of salvation. So that was even forecast. Everything that everyone would seem to do was all part of the, the script. It's everything was forecasted. That was definitely a part of Ken's lesson. Everyone sometimes holds Ken up on a pedestal, but basically Ken came to Judy and he said, I want this copyright. Ken and the Foundation for a Course in Miracles wanted the copyright from FIP, from the Foundation for Inner Peace. And Judy knew that was going to be a lesson when Ken told her, I'm not going to handle the copyright the way you did. There would be lessons involved in that. There were some hard lessons. Why, I can tell you why, J Jesus tells you in A Course in Miracles, ownership is a dangerous concept if left to you. What is the copyright? Ownership. It's just a symbol, but it's, it's dangerous if you identify with it in any way. If you have the slightest thought, I am controlled now of that book. Oh boy. Oh no, J.C. Central's in charge of absolutely everything and anything that you try to do that goes against J.C. Central will result in difficulty. And Ken himself would, would later say, well, that was a mistake. You know, in fact, after Ken passed away, guess what the Foundation for A Course in Miracles did? They handed it back to the Foundation for Inner Peace. The lesson is forgiveness. The lesson is not being identified with anything. You must realize the impossibility of ownership, ultimately, because in heaven there is no ownership. You don't get to heaven and say, oh, where's my acreage? I got a lot of abundance. I did a great life on earth. Do I have some abundance going on here in heaven? Well, if you don't have any real estate, you have just the real. <laughs> it's called spirit. The seven what? There's not seven virgins in heaven? <laughs> oh. yeah. So, you know, people talk about this stuff, but basically, you know, when I talk about the community that I've set up is basically, it's not based on personal ownership. People say, that's a cult, that's radical and everything. No, it's not. Come on now, let's get honest. Let's look at the teachings of A Course in Miracles. You know, basically, freely you have received, now freely give. Haven't all the mystics and saints been telling us to share? Just share. There's plenty here if we let the Holy Spirit lead the way. These roundtables that you're getting started, that's good, but that, we've been doing expression sessions for many, many years. The people I brought along with me, they're like, this is cool. Roundtables are expression sessions. Everyone's equal. Everyone shares from the heart. Nobody holds anything back. You have love and acceptance. I've been doing this for years and years and years, and it leads to telepathy. It leads to open hearts. It leads to joy and laughter and love. There's nothing new under the sun. This, we're, it's a time the idea has come. I was saying at the end of the first one yesterday, this could be our way of relating. Why don't we just 
have round tables everywhere. <laughs> let's do every conference with round table expression sessions. Let's dance, let's sing, let's celebrate. Also, practical speaking, you know, I, I'm interested in what's happening with Jesus' plan. When I met with Judy's daughter, Tamara, who's taking over, because Judy's 87 and Witt's 90 now, and that's our tribe, you know, and so Foundation for Inner Peace. And so I, I talked with him, and Tamara's like, well, actually, Mom has had no business plan all these years, uh, and her business plan is pray and ask and follow. She has no business plan, and actually, she, Tamara told me that the Foundation for Inner Peace was there, that they were in some financial difficulty. Oh, the elders, the publishers, the ones that have translated it into these 20, 22, 25 languages have, need some help. And, of course, the help is going to come from JC Central because <laughs> everything happens for a reason. There's nothing out of place. But when she said that to me, I said, okay. So at one lunchtime, uh, I said, wow, this is great that we're all here. And Judy said, let us all hold hands. We were at a circular table, <laughs> again, a round table. Let us all hold hands and pray, like the original four did. Ken, Judy, Helen, Bill, they prayed. She told me the whole story about when they prayed for publishing and Helen said, Judy will hear the answer, and Judy heard, make the commitment first. Some of you know that part of the story. Well, we all prayed, and when they came to me, they said, David, what did you hear? And I heard, fun raiser. <laughs> Let's have a fun raiser. <laughs> fun, F-U-N. <laughs> That's what J.C. Central sees. They don't see, J.C. Central doesn't seem a, a lack of funds. <laughs> he sees, we need a fun raiser. That's so what Gary was saying. We need, we need to have fun with this. We can't take this too serious. Let's have a fundraiser. So that's what we're doing next July 17th out here in the West, except one state over uh, at, at the monastery. Tamara's coming. Judy and Whit don't really travel. He's got a pacemaker and he's 90 and they're really content. Anybody here can go and visit them. They would love it, but they don't travel. But, but probably Bob Rosenthal and Tamara, who will be taking over in September or so as the new co-directors of the Foundation for Inner Peace, they'll, I think they'll be there. John Monday has agreed to come. John was a very good friend of, of Helen's. Carol Howe, Carol Howe, what a, a magnificent teacher. New Bill, I've had talks with her for years. She tells me all the intimate details and miracles of their relationship. She's going to come and she said one of the things she would talk about at the celebration of inner peace, we we're calling it the celebration of inner peace, we aren't going to have speakers, we're just going to let the Holy Spirit and J.C. Central speak. We're not going to have speakers. Um, so you're not coming to hear a speaker, you're just going to come to hear celebration and joy moving through. We're not going to have speakers. But, but basically she said she would talk about the legends and the elders. Isn't that fun? I'm interested to hear about the legends and the elders. <laughs> I'd like to get the Luckets, maybe. I could get them over, too, from Hawaii. That's just another example. And for some people, may, they may say, well, I thought the Foundation of Inner Peace was perfectly fine financially, but actually, basically, I was told that with every translation, it's about a half a million dollars. Because these translations, you're not translating lading some uh, factory manual. This is the translation of A Course in Miracles to try to keep the meaning the same. And they keep revising the translations. But between hiring professional translators, Ken working with them for years and years, and all the transportation and everything, and then the publishing of it and the distribution, they were saying that each translation averages a half a million dollars. Count that, add those up and see how maybe the elders and maybe all of us could, could do with supporting the elders if we want it to be continued to be translated into languages. If we value that, if we feel like that's a valuable use of time and space, we hook in with J.C. Central and maybe he will activate us to listen, learn, and do, to actually be active in doing something about that. That's the way it's gone for me. I didn't plan on, you know, going to the jungles of, 
of, of Colombia to print A Course in Miracles in Spanish on Bible paper, but I was activated. And I think all of us can be activated in a good way. And that just may be part of your calling. And maybe like Regina, there are those that go into silence for deep, long periods. That's, that's very traditional. When you look at Yogananda, Ramana Maharshi, and the great saints, then that has to be fully something that you can go, yes, I will, this is my heart. This is what my heart is calling me to do. Also, I've been talking to some of you because some of you have been saying, hey, it's good to have you out here in the West. You know, it's like you made it to Colorado. All right, that's this part. <laughs> Actually, uh, the next big kind of conference is going to be in San Francisco in 2018, but now I know of four events that are going to be out here next door in Utah. We're actually having not only the celebration of, celebration of inner peace on July 17th next year at the monastery, but nearby in Midway, Jimmy Twyman. Has anyone heard of Jimmy Twyman, the peace troubadour? Jimmy Twyman and I got talking about this, these kind of things, and he's very much, you know, he went off to pray with Saddam Hussein, do a, a concert for Saddam Hussein, and he more recently went to Syria uh, to do a concert there, and so he's very inspired by the Course, and he, he said, let's do like a, a, a conference somewhere out there, maybe. He found a nice lodge in Midway, so I think that's going to be in April of next year, and then we're going to do a, another like retreat um, shortly thereafter, I think the same week. The weekend will be the conference in the lodge in Midway, and then we'll do at the monastery a smaller thing. We've got a stage. We like to sing, we like to laugh, we do our parties. We don't have seven virgins, but <laughs> maybe you're part of that, I don't know. <laughs> seven Virginians. Seven Virginians, okay. <laughs> we just, Cheryl's got a tweak of that. Seven Virginians. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what, what that means is, is and, and I think too, Barrett and Cheryl, you're, gonna, you're organizing maybe a couple of those, at least two out of three or something like this. So, so we've got really, the Spirit is just activating us. Let's get into the joy. Let's get into the love. Let's get into the happiness. Let's live the experience of this. The theories, the theologies, even the course, the theology of the course, you will have to forget the theology of the course. People say, oh, it's blasphemy. No, <laughs> it's not blasphemy. It actually is when you come into the atonement, the atonement is the awareness that the separation never happened. How do you have a theology covering the waking up from what never happened when you step into an experience of innocence, of divine innocence? So in the end, that's part of forget this course that Dove mentioned, is you do have to forget the, the theology. Dove hit it right on the head with the perfect equality, because we don't go into oneness without perfect equality first. And also, we've emphasized practice, but we're really talking about practicing getting in touch with your internal teacher. Because in the end, the ego enjoys studying itself, and Jesus and JC Central is not asking you to make a ritual ultimately, out of A Course in Miracles. If you study the workbook, it will tell you, if you do it, it will say our, our use for words is almost over, we're letting go of rituals, we but go into the silence and let the Holy Spirit direct the way, and then, of course, Dove mentioned the last five lessons of the workbook. This holy instant would I give to you be you in charge. Are there any more powerful words to launch beyond the Course in Miracles and in touch with your internal teacher? You may still refer to it in gratitude, you may still use it, but it's not saying just cast it aside and never look at it again, but, it's, but as far as it being your companion on this journey, there will come a point where you transcend the Course in Miracles. Hallelujah! Hallelujah for that too! We're, we're into the joy of that.
Okay, I see the beaming smiles. They're coming on. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>